Citigroup cuts 4,500 jobs and takes up to almost $1 billion in charges for the fourth quarter. Germany, though, successfully borrowing more than 4 billion euros at a low yield. And the European bailout fund will kick off a short-term funding program by the end of the year. All while markets waiting on the edge of their seat for the European Union's two-day summit, hoping for an end to the debt crisis. I'm Alex Steele, and the morning call starts right now. Good morning, I'm Alex Steele from The Street, and we have a very special morning call for you today. We have Scott here, as always, with the technical analysis, and we have Stephanie Link, Director of Research for The Street, here with the fundamentals. We're going to break it down for you, the end of the year trading, and into 2012. Good morning, guys. Happy Wednesday. Good morning. Big Wednesday. Big Wednesday. <laughs> All right, so let's get to it. First, has this rally mounted to anything? Has it been constructive for you as a trader? You can look at it two ways. From a macro standpoint, we had last week, we had a huge move. We had that 8% move off the lows, yeah. and now we're going sideways. So traders are trying to figure out if we can get an additional move mm -hmm. because most of the move is, has happened overnight. Right. So every time you try and buy something, you try and buy when it's up, by the end of the day it's down, and then you have to figure out whether or not you want the risk tolerance to take it into the next day. Whereas from a macro view, you know, things look good, the range is getting tight, and it seems like if we can get some good news on Friday or Thursday or Friday into Monday, we could break above the resistance and have some kind of Santa Claus move that would pay people for staying the course. Stephanie, as a longer term investor, is that kind of what you're looking at as well? It's a really big week. Um, you know, you, you have, you know, the ECB, you have the Bank of England, you rumor speculation that they're going to ease, which they should, right? And there's commentary that they will. You've got this big, e, you know, the European meeting and a lot of expectations for them to do something. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to get through those. And I actually also think that the, the news out of China is going to be also market moving in terms Inflation of PPI, Friday, CPI, right? industrial production, so that they can continue to ease if those numbers are good. That's a big positive to me and a big offset to what's going on in Europe. So that raises the next question, and we were speaking about this before we got on camera, is what do both of you need to see on Friday in particular from the EU summit or perhaps from China to make you feel better about the market, to really feel like we're going to have some kind of Santa Claus rally into the end of the year? There is so much that needs to be done there that we need clarity on. I think we just want to see that they're going to agree and no one's really going to fight what needs to be put in place. And I think they're finally talking besides the monetary union, the physical union. So if they could agree to some kind of framework to then ratify what you're saying should happen in March, then maybe the markets could get away from Europe and we could talk technicals, we could go individual stocks, fundamentals, and then we have some room to go before we have to worry or obsess about what's coming out of Europe, but then we also have to watch what's going on in China. Right, but I, I would also just say a lot of what's going on here is such a lack of confidence, right? Because we all, we don't know if Europe is going to get their act together, as you mentioned. If they could come to some sort of agreement, you know, if there's, you know, what's the bailout? What's the leverage? You know, what are the numbers out there? I'm not sure the actual numbers themselves are going to be that important, but I think the direction that if they can take in terms of, you know, getting something completed, I think that will be very positive. Again, if you add on some of these other things that are happening, China, you better U.S data and that kind of thing. So very quickly, does it matter if it's a fiscal consolidation or union uh, thesis we see on Friday, or does it more matter about the, the bailout fund? Does it more matter about the ECB? Well, it's the one thing they really need to agree on if no, they have I, to pick one. Well, no, I would actually say you have to make you have to make steps on all of them, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you have to make, and it doesn't, but it doesn't have to be this massive home run. It could right. be a double, you know. Uh, and, a double would be good. A double and then, would be and then really we could good. steal third base and then everyone's fine. <laughs> We're going to go for this, this analogy will last for a long it's time. It's like a with formula you. That, that we need. It's just it's not one thing. Unfortunately, right. this whole world, we're, we're looking at so many multiple things. So that's, that's why right. you have to really know your time frame, know what you're willing to risk, how long you're willing to hold things. And if we take a look at the S&P chart, yep. you know, you'll see how we're, we're constricting and we're ready for something. All right, so Scott, let's go to the chart because I do want to see what a trader is going to do into the EU summit on Friday. Okay, so if you take a quick look at the S&P, I'll show you on the, the SPX. Okay, obviously this was the reversal low October 4th. You had a fast and furious move up to 1292. A lot of people miss that because it happened so fast. Then you had this wedge right here that wound up resolving to the downside. If you guys remember Thanksgiving week where traders and, and long-term investors weren't that thankful, this was the worst week since 1932, you had a stomach buying that. So now we're right back where we were, where traders were looking for a breakout. So we're trying to see if we could hold in here. You have a short-term little range here above 1240. I think you can have pent-up demand. And if we could finally get above 1260, 1264, the 200 day, with some volume, with some good news this weekend, I think we clear it. First stop, 1292, and then going into the first quarter, we could hit 1320 to 1340. So Scott, does that mean that you're going to be taking stocks long into Friday? 
It all depends how we get there. Right okay. now, we're opening up a little bit as a trader. I'd love to see us do it beforehand so you don't have to take so much risk into the weekend. So if we actually broke above 1262 today's Wednesday and come Thursday on the close, we're like at 1285, 1290. I feel like I caught some of the trade, mm -hmm. and then you keep some on or maybe have multiple positions mm -hmm. with an index hedge just in case we don't get the outcome and you have to just hold the stocks that you really like. Now, Stephanie, what about you? I was going to say, what, what are you doing? I know that you were buying on that dip on Thanksgiving. That was really hard. <laughs> it was hard, <laughs> certainly. Um, so we're not doing a lot this week. We're kind of waiting to see what happens in terms of the news. But I would say this, that if we do get a sell-off, let's just say we don't get what we, what we all want or what we think we need. You know, the, the companies this week, speaking at conferences, because I've been to a dozen conferences this week, they've said some really good things. Valuations still are very attractive, right? And I think that their projections from what we're hearing from these companies in 2012 is not so bad. Mm -hmm. So if we get a pullback, we would definitely be a buyer. And if we actually see the stock, the market run up, we're positioned there already. Well, the beauty of what you do also is like traders don't like to buy into weakness. Mm -hmm. So you mm -hmm. bought right. that week yeah. you with a longer term time frame right. when we were all trying and there was no bounce. If you look back at the chart, you'll see, you know, every single day it was just a bleed lower. Yeah. A lot of guys got short when we broke this wedge because that was the trade to do, maybe covered into here. And then I know these two days is where we're like, okay, this is a spot to buy. This is a Fibonacci retracement. It also coordinates with that broken down trend here. You know, so to buy into this, you don't have to be positioning here as a trader, you know, that didn't position there. You know, we have to try and figure out if we can catch this next move and be somewhat risk averse. So let's walk this out for 2012. Let me, let me name some of the risks. <laughs> that, that we can look at so I can, get, I can get your outlook. All right, so we have perhaps China slowing 7%, a complete meltdown in the Eurozone, and also a lot of meltdown here in the U.S. in terms of political. I mean, if you look at the S&P, I read some stats, that the worst government you can have is a Democratic president and a split Congress in the fourth year of an election cycle. That's exactly what we have. The S&P tends to go lower on that. Um, we also have perhaps the end of the unemployment benefits and the end of the payroll tax cut. Stephanie, what's your outlook? Well, I mean, you know, a lot can change in 2012, right? So I would just say at least the way we're positioned is, um, you know, for a, a gradual uh, higher market um, because U.S., uh, there's a lot of issues politically, but fundamentally, GDP-wise, you're looking at about 2 to 3%, maybe with the bias towards the upside. Mm -hmm. Just a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about a double-dip recession here, right? Now we're not. So I think that is encouraging, right? And again, it's I go to these conferences and I listen to these companies and I listen to what they're saying about 2012. Caterpillar just yesterday yesterday talking about 10 to 20 percent sales growth reiterating that that guidance that, that that's a widespread right. but it's a good it's a great number for for a company that you know has such exposure globally I also think again China could be the wild card if they continue to aggressively ease Brazil has just eased for the third time this year so I think there are offsets Alex and I think that you know Europe is horrible but I think we already know they're in a recession and I think again based on valuations we're, we're pricing in a lot of bad mm -hmm. news for the long term mm. and lastly it turns into the tape Okay, we're in December and typically strong stocks end stronger because portfolio managers want to mark them up. They want to have the best acting stocks. So and European investors different. need somewhere to go in right. addition. Sure. <laughs> so, so like stocks that have been strong, like we've all talked about, IBM can go higher into the close. Google looks good. Intel looks good. Stocks that have been acting well, they act even better. And then even with the January effect names, like you said at the financial conference, mm -hmm. that they all perked up. They have no more tax loss on, so perhaps Goldman Sachs breaks above 102 for another move. Bank of America gets to six and a half. JP Morgan gets to 36. So this is and, like the trade. And also consumer, if you listen, TJX is at a new high. Yum Brands raised guidance mm -hmm. the other day. So there's some good things that are happening. We just kind of have to settle down and get some answers on Europe to kind of move us, I think, higher. Two quick things, okay. though. I was reading a note from Societe Generale that said if we don't see an extension of the payroll tax cut, in addition to unemployment benefits, that could shave off as much as one and a half full percentage points. We also have Bank of America coming out with it, Merrill Lynch coming out with a note today that puts the U.S. recession risk at 40 percent for next year. Do you guys think that those overblown, th those fears, and we really need to focus elsewhere? I'm going to focus on the price action because everyone's always going to have something to say. <laughs> you know, people say this is already priced in. Yeah. Some people say yeah. it's not priced in. It seems like this whole year has been priced in, but every time we get something calamitous, like when I Italian yields went above seven or everything that breaks, you know, the market comes in, mm -hmm. then we take it in stride, mm -hmm. and then the cream rises to the top, and then you take your trades because there's always something to look to mm -hmm. make you say, I don't want to be in the stock market. But overall, things are rewarding investors, you know, market participants that, that actively manage, that, that know how to buy, that pick the winning stocks, right. they can make money. Wow. Stephanie, the, other, you? the other thing is, um, what's interesting to note is that only um, hedge funds are about 45% net long. <laughs> that is a really interesting stat. So if we do start to get any kind of momentum over the next couple of weeks, it won't take much to continue to go higher. All right, fair enough. Okay, we are going to be right back after this. We're going to talk about energy, oil prices, and five stocks you're not going to want to miss. So stay with us. Hi. 
I'm Sean Hendelman, CEO of T3 Live, where we train, coach, and mentor traders in order to help you put your money to work with confidence. The T3 Live approach is a blueprint for you to recognize, adapt, and ultimately take advantage of different market conditions. To begin your training with T3 Live, we would like to offer you the opportunity to enroll in our free 30-day online home study course. Fill in your name and email address, and I'll see you on the other side.